I'm pleased to be back in what is a reasonably familiar room, having visited, as I said, on a number of previous occasions as uh, representative of Antero, the Financing for Development Office. But today I would like to make two very simple points because we're trying to make our presentations as rapid as possible. And the first is that the theories that Prebish proposed when he was working here and subsequently at UNCTAD, many people have discarded as being either no longer relevant because of historical changes or having been historically or theoretically wrong. And I would like to argue that in fact, by some paradox of history, Prebish is probably as much if not more relevant today than he was in the 1950s when he was working here. And the basic reason for this that I'm going to argue is that Prebish was very concerned that developing countries be able to provide an alternative to what came to be called mono-commodity dependence by building up an industrial sector. Beluso explained to us that many countries have been successful in doing this, but amazingly a number of countries have been successful in undoing this, so that the policies that were appropriate to support industrialization are in fact also the very same policies that are appropriate for preventing or reversing deindustrialization. And in fact this is the main problem that most Latin American countries are facing today. Now, why is that? Well, I think everybody is more or less in reasonable agreement, at least from what I heard from the first panel, that the period of the free gift that is produced by the increasing incomes generated by the rising terms of trade are over. They're over for two reasons. The first reason is that China will either undergo a financial crash or China will succeed in rebalancing its domestic policies and start growing at around 4% or 5% as a desired outcome. Whether it comes about as a collapse of the financial system or a success in terms of rebalancing policy. One way or the other, China as the driver of global commodity prices will no longer be relevant. The second factor is that the financial systems in the developed countries that were a major contributor to the increasing terms of trade in terms of rising commodity prices will no longer be a relevant factor as they were in the period uh, in from the middle 2000s onwards. So that we can look forward to a decline in the terms of trade or at least a loss of that beneficial effect. Now the alternative to this free gift of the rising terms of trade over the period has been a generalized appreciation of exchange rates. And that generalized appreciation of exchange rates, as most people recognize, is a absolute negative for domestic producers. And more or less over the period, everybody thought things were going reasonably well because the terms of trade more or less offset the negative impact of capital inflows and appreciating currencies. Once the terms of trade disappear, then we're left quite simply with very large and volatile capital inflows. These capital inflows are not going away. The impact that has been produced by monetary policies in the United States has now been more than redoubled by the decisions of the Japanese government. I will have to say that I am very much in favor of the decisions taken by the Japanese government for Japan but I'm not sure that they are as beneficial for the rest of the world. So that it is quite clear that Latin American countries are going to be in a position where they are going to be under pressure on exchange rates to appreciate capital to continue to flow in 
and as historic history has taught us rising capital inflows and appreciating exchange rates tend to have a depressing impact on domestic investment and a positive impact on domestic consumption other things being equal so that the old what we used to call the external constraint will be back and it will have to be dealt with to give just a, a rough example uh, I was looking on the plane coming over at an estimate of the increase in income as a share of GDP in Brazil as a result of the two factors capital inflows and rising terms of trade and over the last I think four years it averages out at about four percent of GDP some years it was higher than that some years it was lower but at a rough average which means that that four percent will probably no longer be present so the result is that Latin American developing countries will be faced with the problem number one of trying to offset the negative impact of capital inflows on the exchange rate and on domestic growth and at the same time offset it in terms of uh, in terms of deindustrialization. Now the reason that I argue that the policies that were put forward by Pravesh Sapal and a number of other people uh, in the period are relevant today is because they all tended to emphasize this idea of the duality of the development process. Now, those of you who studied development theory when I did, or those of you who, well, probably none of you lived in Italy when I did, but we used to always talk about dualism in terms of, in terms of economic development. And part of that dualism was to suggest that it was appropriate to have differential policies for different sectors. If you look at the work, and I will cite just two additional economists aside from Prebish, and these are Marcel Diamant, uh, an Argentinian economist who has become my absolute favorite in terms of dealing with this particular issue, and Nicholas Calder, who served as a consultant to Sipal on, uh, on a number of occasions in the, in the 1950s. And I'll simply refer to Diamand's work. He approaches this idea of dualism as what he calls an unbalanced productive structure. The unbalanced productive structure means basically that you have a primary commodity sector and an industrial sector. And the behavior of these two sectors is different. It's different, first of all, as Prebish pointed out, because of differences in productivity growth between those two sectors. And the idea of the benefits of industrialization comes primarily from the fact that it produces higher productivity growth, produces higher real wages, and at the same time allows the uh, engagement of the so-called virtuous circle by which higher investment in industry produces higher productivity growth, produces higher real wages, produces higher consumption expenditures, which then provides the profitability for the investments that have been made in industry. So the idea basically on the one hand comes from this difference in productivity. On the other hand, Calder and Diamand looked at it from a slightly different way. They said we have to find ways of making the outputs of the industrial sector competitive. Now we heard this morning of the problems of competition within, uh, within Latin America, but Calder and Diamand were primarily interested in productivity in international markets and this is because the strategy that was put forward by all of these economists which eventually uh, has been described as uh, import substitution industrialization in fact was not simply import substitution it was the fact of using growth from within in the industrial sector financed by means of expanding exports. 
so that the basic problem if you were going to industrialize was not only to industrialize in order to get the increased productivity but to be able to use the industrial sector to gener generate export earnings and the idea is that you could do this by trying to offset what would be a natural deficiency in the competitiveness of your uh, of your domestic industry so that both of these economists, Diamand and, and Caldor, recommended a very simple kind of policy, and that was the possibility of using either differential exchange rates for the two different sectors, or different policies of taxation and subsidy. Now, the, as I mentioned, the idea was that it would be impossible to generate a competitive industrial sector without some sort of intervention on one of these on one of these uh, one of these two fronts. Now, the interesting point is that we no longer talk about these types of policies, and we are willing to accept the fact that exchange rates are determined by free international capital flows and to accept the fact that this will be detrimental for both the competitiveness and the success of domestic industry and to produce in deindustrialization. And the final point that I would like to raise is the question of why we are willing to do this. Now, the only explanation I can come up with is that there is a fundamental difference between what we think about as international financial market and exchange rate stability on the basis of what became the Bretton Woods system and the way we believe that developing countries should generate their development process or the development strategies. So if we think very quickly of what was put forward in Bretton Woods and against this background we have to remember that there were very few at that stage uh, developing countries represented in the discussions. This was a system which was supposed to provide stability for what were basically developed countries. And the entire logic of the Bretton Woods system was that exchange rates should be stable and if the stability of exchange rates produced some sort of imbalance in terms of external accounts or in terms of external behavior that the International Monetary Fund would be quick to intervene if the country could not do so in order to keep those imbalances from becoming excessively large. So that basically the idea was that if the Bretton Woods system was successful, all countries would have as a long-term average a balanced current account, a balanced external position. And the policies of the IMF were designed in order to bring this about. We've all heard the stories of conditionality in order to preserve exchange rate stability. On the other hand, if we look at the development theories that were being put forward at that time, the development theories basically suggested that developing countries faced external constraints that we've talked about in terms of savings gaps or resource gaps. Now, how were we supposed to fill those resource gaps? Well, the idea was the resource gaps were supposed to be filled by international capital or financial inflows. Now, those of you who remember the very nice uh, chart that Beluzzo put up between the capital account and the current account, I will not have to explain to you further that if we are recommending to developing countries that their development is going to be financed by large and sustained capital inflows, that by definition this means that there will be a large and sustained current account deficit. The IMF is an agency that was set up to make sure that those large and sustained current account deficits did not persist and if they were created that they would intervene in order to eliminate them. Now how do you eliminate those large current account deficits? You do that by stifling the growth process. So basically there is a fundamental contradiction between the way we look at international financial stability and exchange rate stability and the policies that we recommended for developing countries. Now obviously in the early part of the 1950s and the 60s the idea is that these would be primarily uh, aid flows, official development assistance, 
In fact, they turned out not to be that. They turned out to be, in general, private capital flows. And the private capital flows aggravated the problem by setting up the difficulties of, uh, the difficulties of debt service and growing international indebtedness. But we don't even have to go to the problem of international, increasing international debt to see that there was a fundamental contradiction between the way the IMF was set up to preserve stability and the way developing countries were encouraged to finance their development process. So that's the first part of that point. The last one I would like to make is that the presumption then was that it was possible to use exchange rate adjustments in order to bring about this kind of stability. And the second point that we find very clear in the work of both Diamand and Caldor is that exchange rate adjustments, in particular the use of devaluations by developing countries, would be essentially destabilizing. Destabilizing, why? Basically because of the differential impact that it would have on the manufacturing sector and the primary commodity sector. Calder makes a very strong argument that any sort of devaluation in order to try and remedy the external constraint or the external deficit would bring about an increase in the prices of uh, imported wage goods, that this would lead to an increase in domestic wages, it would eventually produce a pressure, upward pressure on prices, and in fact create additional instability which then would have to be fought by greater austerity. I don't have to remind you of the similarity of that scenario with the kinds of scenarios that we might be facing in some European countries in a similar case. But the basic point that I'm attempting to make is that the kinds of international stability, the use of exchange rate adjustments uh, through the Bretton Woods process was essentially and structurally detrimental to the possibility of developing countries being able to exploit uh, the growth of their industrial sectors and made it excessively difficult. So that the policies that we use to offset those disadvantages in the early stages of development are exactly the same ones that would be appropriate in the current period of attempting to fight the deindustrialization, which in fact will certainly occur if international capital flows continue to increase and there is continual pressure on exchange rate appreciation in Latin American developing countries. Thank you.